Fellow colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, today I hope to convince all of you that seed oils, the vegetable oils, are practically the sole drivers of overweight, obesity, and virtually all of our chronic westernized diseases. Heart disease, hypertension, stroke, cancers, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, age-related macular degeneration, all the autoimmune diseases, and the list goes on and on. You're going to see in population after population, country after country, that it is not sugars, carbohydrates, fat, animal fat, saturated fat, animal protein, meat, plant lectins, plant toxins, or anything else that has been implicated in obesity or chronic disease. However, you will see that it is the vegetable oils that are the primary drivers because they are the hidden and pernicious destroyers of metabolism, destroyers of people, destroyers of nations. And how do they do this? They're highly pro-oxidative, pro-inflammatory, toxic, and nutrient deficient. And you put those four hazards together and you have the recipe for widespread metabolic destruction and chronic disease. That's how they accomplish this. Vegetable oils represent the single greatest transformational change to the diet of mankind in all of history. They're the single greatest component of processed foods on a caloric basis. And we all know processed foods are devastating. And as you will see here, wherever they go, they leave behind a massive trail of destruction. So let's go back here to 400 BC when Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And realize, there wasn't a speck of processed food in 400 BC, right? In the Renaissance, Paracelsus said, all that man needs for health and healing has been provided by God in nature. The challenge of science is to find it. And then a few hundred years later, in 1939, Weston A. Price, whom I consider the father of nutrition and whom many others do also, wrote, Life in all its fullness is Mother Nature obeyed. So more than two millennia worth of recommendations on natural food, uh, natural substances, right? Does anybody know what this is? Now, yeah, yeah, so, but if you might have guessed that it was a petroleum refinery, you're close. This is a vegetable oil refinery. And uh, the question is, is just by looking at this, does this look like we're obeying nature? This is another vegetable oil refinery. And you might think, why are they so massive? I'll get to that in a moment. But if you don't know, vegetable oil refineries go through a very intensive process to produce these oils. They use a highly intensive mechanical pressing process to crush and press these seeds. And then the seeds are treated, that mush is treated to petroleum-derived hexane solvent bath, and then it's steamed, degummed, chemically alkalinized, chemically bleached, chemically deodorized. Then they're ready to go into the bottle. They're highly oxidized, and if they are not, they will oxidize in the bottle or when you cook with them, and certainly when you metabolize them to produce all sorts of advanced lipid oxidation end products, and that's just the half of it. Now, here's the worst of it. They're producing, in westernized countries, one-eighth to one-third of our food supply. Now realize they didn't exist in 1865 for almost the entire world, and we'll come back to that. So here's the question, are these the healthy fats? Or are they poison, or somewhere in between? And I will submit to you that these are chronic metabolic biological poisons. And um, I've spoken on this many times before, but today I'll try to show you a little bit more about how and why. I won't have much time to get into the biochemistry. Uh, we're going to look more at the evidence, all right? So in, back in the United States, my, uh, my home, um, we've got many nutrition organizations that are, have been recommending these uh, oils. Harvard, um, Tufts University's uh, nutrition department, Mayo Clinic's nutrition department, the American Heart Association, going clear back to 1960. So they're recommending unsaturated fats or seed oils. They're, they go hand in hand. Now, e unfortunately, even the World Health Organization recommends that we can keep our saturated fat to less than 10% of calories 
and consume more unsaturated fats, more seed oils. Well, you know, I like to say, how's that working for you, right? Um, well, the United States consumes more seed oils per capita than any nation in the world. And we, we have for many, many years. We're also the most obese nation in the world, at least of all the OECD or developed nations. Is it just coincidence? We might also be the most unhealthy nation in the world. I believe we are. Again, is it just coincidence to the high vegetable oil consumption? I think not. With this advice coming from the diet dictocrats to consume all these oils and we're, we follow that advice, but we follow it to the T, are we just sheep being led off the cliff? So why are these authorities recommending vegetable oils? And in 60 years of science and evidence, it comes down to this. They lower cholesterol. I can't find any other valid reason, really. Well, guess what? So does arsenic. And no matter how you dress it up, it's still arsenic. And no matter how you dress up the vegetable oils, they're still vegetable oils. And you may think this is a fantastically unfair comparison, but I assure you, this comparison between arsenic and vegetable oils is not so unfair because they both kill us through oxidation. Inflammation cannot hold a candle to oxidation in terms of its devastating potential. That's how they kill us, and that's how vegetable oils maim and kill. All right, now I'm gonna pause just for a moment and I just want to give you my disclosures, um, even though this is not for CME, as, as far as I know. But anyway, I'm a, a, I'm a book author, I'm a researcher, and I'm the director of Cure AMD Foundation and Ancestral Health Foundation. I accept no compensation for any of these roles, nor does anyone that works for us. We're, we're volunteers because we believe in this mission. Now, I want to give a personal disclosure. Um, some of you may know me um, from before, have seen me, just last year, I looked like this, and some have said my hair looks a little different, and I was tired of looking so young, I decided to color my hair white, and <laughs> now, that, that's, that's a lie, but that's the only lie I intend to tell today. Um, so, but I wanna tell you this, that I'm gonna go back here, I'm gonna show you, um, this is my uh, high school graduation picture, 1979. And four years before this, when I was in the eighth grade, when I was 14, I started turning gray. And by the time I was 18, I was so tired of people telling me I had gray hair that just months after this, I started coloring my hair. And, um, and then eventually, just so you know, this is, it's not just a personal thing. I eventually develop, developed arthritis and fatigue and other things I've, and figured out in my 50s that I had nutrient deficiencies, not the least of which was iron. So if you, um, so I corrected those things and, but I also decided to go natural. But it, I just wanted you to know if you have, if you, if there's premature graying or balding, it can be iron, magnesium, and other nutrient deficiencies. So back to our talk. Okay. I will submit to you there's two fundamental drivers of obesity and chronic disease, and it is these things, nutrient deficiency and toxicity. But they come from one source, and it's processed foods. Now I realize we're at the 50,000 foot view here, but just to get at that view. So what are processed foods? And my definition is they're really four things, or defined by four things. Refined flours, refined added sugars, seed oils, vegetable oils that we'll concentrate on today. And um, these have been called vegetable oils since the early 20th century, which is really a euphemism since none of them are from vegetables and uh, they're primarily from seeds, and then, of course, artificially produced trans fats. And though, take those four foods, and that's what lines our grocery store shelves, right? It's just those things, but the important thing about today to realize is that it is the high PUFA, high polyunsaturated fatty acid vegetable oils that are the added fat of choice to all these foods. Just look at these foods, see if you can find butter, lard, or beef tallow, in these foods, you won't hardly ever find it, right? And uh, it's also the added fat of choice and the, the utilized fat of choice to, uh, for fast foods and restaurant foods. So here they are, they look nice and pretty. And I just wanna name these. These are, this is sort of my list of the worst of the worst, corn, canola, cottonseed, rapeseed, grapeseed, sunflower, safflower, and rice bran. I think these are the worst of the worst. These are chronic metabolic biological poisons Next, I'm gonna show you 
some of this evidence. So just with a couple slides here, I want to show you 200 years of dietary evidence. Now, this is the United States, but it's the model that the world began to follow. Now, back, uh, uh, sugar has been in the food supply for hundreds of years. But just between 1822 and 1999, sugar went up 17-fold, from about 6 pounds per person per year up to 107, 108 pounds per person per year. It's a nutrient-deficient food. 1866, the first vegetable oil was introduced for most of the world. It was cottonseed oil. Certainly, the Americas and Europe never had a vegetable oil until then, uh, at least not any significant degree. Um, 1880, roller mill technology was introduced, gave us refined white wheat flour, a nutrient deficient food. And then finally, Procter & Gamble introduced good old Crisco, trans fats in 1911. That's processed food, those four things. Still the same today. And so when people argue that, you know, that it's all about USDA, low fat guidelines, 1980, I don't quite buy that because here's the processed foods in place by 1911, then this exploded by 2009, 63% of the American diet made up of those four foods and chronic disease looks something like that, that uh, red line there, hypothetically. Let's focus on the vegetable oils. So, this is our published data from 2017. Now, you can see up to 1865, there in the far lower left, we had no vegetable oils in the food supply. They entered into 1866, and then by 2010, we're at 80 grams per person per day. 80 grams, ladies and gentlemen, is 720 calories worth. That's 32% of U.S. caloric intake. Now, think of it this way. 1,900, 99% of added fats came from animal fat. 2005, 86% of added fat came from vegetable oils and still climbing. Now, this is where the dietary guidelines were introduced. Now, let me put this on a different uh, graph here. So this is 1980, where we were told to go low fat, and indeed we did. We went down from about 39% down to about 33% fat over the next decade. But this is not where the problem began. The problem began back here when cottonseed oil was allowed into our food supply. And that's a long story that Nina Teicholz has told over and over. Um, today, seed oils and factory farmed animals fed GMO corn and soy uh, now account for 93% of our omega-6. Now, we're getting all this omega-6 mostly from these things, seed oils and factory farmed animals. All right, what did this do to our, to our food supply? So we modeled the consumption in 1865, and there's where it is. That's what our omega-6 linoleic acid, and if you don't know, linoleic acid is the 18-carbon omega-6 that accounts for about 90% of our omega-6. We're at 2.2 grams per person per day when we didn't have seed oils and factory-farmed animals. That's 1% of calories. All right, where were we in 1909? 2% of calories, 4.84 grams a day. Why? Because we had cottonseed oil then, and then soybean oil was introduced that year. So we had doubled our omega-6 linoleic acid. We're at 1999, we're at 7% of calories, 18 grams a day, because we got all the other seed oils. And then 2008, we're at 11.8% of calories, 29 grams a day. We went from 2.2 grams of omega-6 LA linoleic acid to 29 grams a day in about 145 years. That's a 12-fold increase in omega-6, whether you look at it as a percentage or as a mass. All right, is that a problem? Well, let's start here. Many will say, oh, it's not a problem because it's, it's an essential fat. You only need 0.35 to 0.5% of omega-6, and you might need up to 2% as an infant, but you don't need it longer than, more than that after probably one year of age, and that's the most you would ever need is 2%. All right, so we'd need it, but as Paracelsus said, Back in the, in the Renaissance, all things are poison. Nothing is without poison. The dose alone makes sure that a thing is not poison. Translated, the dose makes the poison. So is this a poison? Well, 1865, linoleic acid was 1 one-hundredth of our calories, 1%. 2008, LA is one-eighth of our calories, 12%. You just saw it. We only need 2% absolute maximum. That's what all of the ancestral... Uh, cultures are consuming less than 2%. I've showed this in other presentations. So this is a poison, and I'm going to try to show you more about how and why. But the, but the, the first thing to realize 
is that it's a poison because it accumulates in our body fat. And this is a study published by Stefan Guiané about seven years ago that looked at, this is 37 collated studies in the United States where they analyzed the body fat and looked at the fatty acid profiles. And this is how much LA was in our body fat on average. 1959 was 9.1%. Uh, and as our seed oils went up, by 2008, we're at 21.5% in our body fat. Here that is plotted against our vegetable oil consumption. And you see the re strong relationship. In fact, this is a mathematical relationship. Whatever it is in your diet, it will approximately double in your body fat. It takes about two to three years to get there if you have a steady diet. And then it'll also take the, the half-life of LA in your body fat is 600 to 680 days. All right, so um, now, what happens to you? Well, if your consumption's over 2%, as I said, over optimal, now you're in a pro-oxidative state because now this LA is sitting there and it's highly, uh, uh, has a high potential for oxidation. It is pro-inflammatory, it is toxic through advanced lipid oxidation end products like four hydroxynonanol, malondialdehyde, carboxyethylpyrrole, acrolein, and there's hundreds of others. It's like smoking a cigarette which produces thousands of mutagens and carcinogens. When you consume these oils, they, uh, they undergo oxidation and uh, produce all of these advanced lipid oxidation end products where it's highly damaging. Finally, these oils are all nutrient deficient, all of them. They have no vitamins A, D, or K2, like you would get from lard, butter, and beef tallow, right? So you put these all together and you have the recipe for disaster, metabolic disease and physical degeneration. That's it in a nutshell. That's all the time I have for that because now we're going to look at the evidence. So this is the United States and this is a nutrition experiment in what Weston A. Price called nature's laboratory, right? Because you can't control diets for decades, which is how long a lot of these chronic diseases take to develop. Right? In fact, the longest the diets have been controlled in people is a few weeks, a few months. Um, you have to put them in a metabolic ward. can't be done. So we need to follow it in nature's laboratory. Well, here we go. This is uh, vegetable oils in the black curve versus heart disease deaths in the red. This is our published data, again, from 2017. And I want you to notice the extraordinary relationship between vegetable oils and heart disease. But look at the saturated fat. It is virtually flat. So let's look at total meat consumption. I'm going to highlight it in red here. This is over the past 200 years. So if you go back to the far left, you can see that this 1800 to 1900, but roughly the first half of this graph, you see that total meat consumption was going down, right? But there was only eight papers on coronary heart disease, as far as I'm aware, for the entire 19th century. Only about three of those on thrombotic disease, in other words, myocardial infarction. 1912, first documented heart attack in the US, uh, documented with autopsy evidence. Then in 1930s, heart disease became the leading cause of death, and it has remained the leading cause of death ever since. So interestingly, heart disease became the leading cause of death at the nadir of meat consumption, right? At the lowest point of meat consumption in the past two centuries. So if you were to logically try to blame meat you, you, or, or, or equate this to meat, you would have to, I think, conclude lack of meat caused heart disease, right? We're at the lowest point when heart disease becomes the leading cause of death, all right? Or maybe there's no relationship at all. This is cancer in the United States, going back to 1811 on the far, your far lower left over here. So what, how many cancer deaths were there? 0.5%, about one in 188 deaths due to cancer in Boston in 1811. By 1900, you can see more in the middle of the graph, cancer took one in 17 lives, 5.8%. And you can see as the sugar was rising and vegetable oils were in the mix there. And then on the far right, cancer took almost one in three lives, 31.1% by 2010. Now you can't really separate out the vegetable oils and the sugar, maybe it's both and lots of other things too, maybe just processed foods in general, right? We see an extraordinary increase in cancer from one in 188 200 years ago to one in three today. So let's just look at, this is obesity in the United States versus just vegetable oils. And I want you to look at the far lower left, we see that um, obesity was 1.2% in the 19th century, Scott Allen Carson's work. 
But if you move clear over to the middle of the graph, you can see obesity had risen to 13.4%, 1961. And then on the far right, upper right, obesity is 42.5%. But look at the extraordinary correlation with the vegetable oils. They move in lockstep. Now let's throw sugars into the mix. So we got sugars on the graph. But again, let's start here back in 1900 when obesity was 1.2%. Notice how high sugar already is. In fact, it's approaching 300 uh, calories, right? In 1907, it exceeded 300 calories when obesity was about 1%, right? 15% of calories uh, of sugar already, right? And then in 1961, you can see that after about the 1920s, sugar was already um, a be between 400 and 500 calories a day. And we know obesity was very low in the 1920s through 50s. All right. And then on the, again, the far right, you can see that, again, there's a very strong correlation with uh, vegetable oils in the blue, but little relationship to sugar here. Okay, this is more recent obesity in the United States, beginning 1961 on the far lower left when obesity was 13%. And then we, you can see if you follow the red line that obesity ends at 42.4% in 2018. And, uh, but look at the sugar, not very much change over this period, right? But there's an incre incredible uh, correlation to the vegetable oils. In fact, during this period, 1961, to um, 2018, sugars only went up 14%, vegetable oils up 230%, but obesity climbed more than threefold, 13% to 42.4%, right? We're gonna get, move in a little more recent. This is obesity in the US between 1999 and 2018. And so you see, watch obesity in the red there, climbed from 30.5% to 42.4%. .4%. But here we see sugar falling since at least 2004 and by, since 1999 in some data. Uh, so while sugar fell, obesity went through the roof, right? But in, again, in lockstep to vegetable oils. This is severe obesity. You can see in 1999, it was 4.7%. Rises all the way to 9.2%. But look at the sugar falling, of course. Same data, so that, that doesn't change. All right, so... Um, Sugars during this period down 8%, vegetable oils up 30%, severe obesity doubles. You say, well, it's the carbohydrates, right? Well, here's carbohydrates in the United States, declined from 1997, as you see at the bottom there in the green, um, declined from 1997 through 2013, while obesity elevated from approximately 29% to 38% during the exact same period. So while sugars fell, carbohydrates fell in the United States, obesity went through the roof. This is diabetes in the United States going clear back to the 19th century, all right? Look on your far lower left over here, diabetes only 0.0028%. And if you think this is not accurate, it is. In fact, this is published by Sir, the famous Sir William Osler, one of the founding partners of Johns Hopkins. He published this in his first textbook, Principles and Practice of Medicine, I believe it was called, 1893. It was taken from the U.S. Census. That is 2.8 per 100,000 people. That's how many diabetics there were that year. But look how high the sugar already is. It's approaching 300 calories a day, right? But the vegetable oils between 1866 and 1908 were only one to two grams a day. They were negligible, all right? Move clear up here to 1935. And you'll see at the top there, sugar consumption exceeded 450 calories a day, 23% of calories, almost a fourth of calories coming from sugar in 1935, yet diabetes only affected one in 270 people. And many of those, maybe most of those were still type one. If you look at the bottom there, it was 0.37% diabetes. Um, now in the far right, you see that uh, diabetes, uh, and, most recent data, 2016, affects 13% of people in the U.S. So a very strong correlation to the vegetable oils, not much correlation to sugar here. Now this page represents, I don't know if you can see those, but it's 100,000 dots, and I'm doing this to try to represent what diabetes would have been in 1890 when it affected three per 100,000. I tried to highlight in the upper left here, three dots, it's hard to do, in the red there, all right? That's how many there were in 1890. Here's how many diabetics we have in 2016, 13,000 per 100,000. 
So this is an increase of 4,643 fold over a period of 126 years. So I didn't test it, but I think it's statistically significant increase. <laughs> now, let's go back to this, where we were in 1890, 2.8 per 100,000. That was 1,764 diabetics in the entire United States, 63 million people that year. All right, if these ratios persisted, there would be just over 9,000 diabetics in 2016 out of a population of 323 million today. How many do we have today? 34.1 million diabetics. So we have more than 34 million excess diabetics. Why? Well, let's go back to this. So this is more recent. And we're looking again in the United States, vegetable oils and sugar versus diabetes. So sugar in the green, vegetable oils in the blue, and diabetes in the red. And you can see the diabetes in 1991 was 2.97%. And on the far upper right, diabetics 13%. Um, notice again, while the sugar declined since 2004, right? The diabetes goes through the roof in lockstep with vegetable oil consumption. So there's the curve, that's the trend line for uh, vegetable oil right there that in blue. Okay, now we're gonna move into your backyard. I'm sick of mine. So um, United Kingdom, another nutrition experiment. So take a look, here is, um, this is uh, vegetable oils and sugar versus obesity, diabetes, and adipose LA. Um, with data going back to 1942, at least for some for sugar and vegetable oils. So the sugar's in the green, vegetable oil's in the blue there. And um, I want you to notice here at the bottom, look at obesity in 1980, 7% is where you were. Where is it in 2019? 28%, so it went up fourfold, right? Here's diabetes, 2.5% um, uh, in 1994, rises all the way to 7.5% by 2019. But look at the strong correlation with the vegetable oils in the blue, while, again, while the sugar has declined since 1960, all right? Now, I created these into trend lines um, so that it's a little easier to see. So you just have kind of the beginning and ending point, but look at the sugar on the fall, and, and then everything else follows the vegetable oils. The linoleic acid in the body fat, the obesity, and the diabetes. And here's the numbers, the sugar trend, or sugars declined 28% in this period, vegetable oils doubled, linoleic acid in the body fat more than doubled, obesity quadrupled, and diabetes tripled. Let's look at Australia, their nutrition experiment in their own laboratory. So at the very top, you'll see sugar in the green, as usual. You can see sugar nearly steadily declined after 1961 in Australia. And um, by the way, this data in Australia and the UK has been published multiple times before. Um, so uh, this has been verified multiple times. And the data comes from the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Um, so anyway, there's sugar on the decline after 1961 for the most part. And you can see the vegetable oils in blue that climbs almost steadily like it does throughout the entire, almost the entire world is this way. And then look at the diabetes, 9% 1980, all the way to 31.3% by 2018. So the obesity climbs more than threefold. Diabetes is climbing, chronic disease is climbing. Those are short lines because that's all the data they had. You think, well, but it's the carbohydrates. Well, here's their carbohydrates. So you can see carbohydrates decline after 1970 in Australia. Again, but we see the obesity climb dramatically. Um, uh, it right in lockstep with the vegetable oils in blue. Everybody see that? All right, let's look at Israel. This is their nutrition experiment. So this is vegetable oils in the blue at the top, and, and Israel's had the highest seed oil consumption as a percentage of total fat of any country in the world. Um, and they, their seed oil consumption has been very high since 1950s. Um, but look what happened with their diabetes as their vegetable oils have been climbing recently. Their diabetes was 3.4% in 1996, all the way to 9.7% by 2019. Um, again, as the vegetable oils went up, but look at the sugar on the decline in the green um, during uh, right around 1999 into the early 2000s. So sugar dropped quite a lot while their diabetes went through the roof.
So Israel has the highest relative seed oil consumption as a proportion of total fat in the world, 94% of all added fats coming from seed oils. While you can see at the bottom, butter and ghee and animal fat is extraordinarily low. This is China. And let's look at what happened in their, in their uh, labor nature's laboratory. So the first thing I want to point out is it's hard to see these until you start digging into the data, but China's sugar consumption is the eighth lowest in the world. All right, and we'll get to the numbers momentarily, but keep that in mind. Um, look at their vegetable oils in the blue. And then I'm going to show you here, if you, and this, the numbers are a little bit small, um, but I'll pop that up there again. So this is uh, overweight and obesity in the red there. 15.3% in 1991 in China, all the way up to 42% by 2015. Now we're going to look at the cancer in the orange, 495 in the lower there per 100,000. That's his total cancer incidence. Um, climbed all the way to 1,587 per 100,000 people. Again, these are incidents or cases. So overweight and obesity tripled. Cancers tripled. Now, the sugar, only four to five teaspoons per person per day. 60 to 80 calories of sugar per person per day. 2.5% of calories is sugar. Again, one of the very lowest in the world. But what do we see the correlation to? Vegetable oils, which is what we see over and over. How about Japan? This is the quintessential nation to illustrate all of these points. Now, we're going to go through just the nutrition transition first so that you can see all the numbers. So this goes back to where these numbers are uh, is 1960 approximately right there. That's, that's what their total calories was in 1960, 2,837. Dropped all the way to 1,850. Dropped about a third um, by 2009. Here's their carbohydrates, 84% in 1960 when they were fantastically healthy. Dropped all the way to 56% by 2009. Here's their sugar, 1960, 196. Climbed up to 384 calories by 1989, then back down to 282 calories. All right, now look at the, toward the bottom, um, sorry, just got the number there. Sugar is down 27% between 1989 and 2010. Here's the total fat elevated from 5% up to 27%. So we've got calories going down, carbs going down, sugar going down, fats going up. Let's look at vegetable oils next. Okay, the, um, so vegetable oils were 81 calories in 1961, um, climbing all the way to 351 calories by 2010. All right, let's see what this does to us, all right, or to them. This is obesity in men. You can see that in uh, about 1977, I believe it was, obesity was 16% in men, right? Climbs all the way to 31.2% by 2009. So obesity doubles in men in Japan during this period while the carbs go down, the sugar goes down, and the calories go down. But this is what we see in the animal studies, right? When you add vegetable oils. This is diabetes in Japan. And on the lower left here, you'll see diabetes only 0.02% in 1954. That's two per 10,000. Where does it climb to? 6.9% by 2009. While the calories go down, carbs go down, sugars go down. But what, it, again, it runs a parallel to the vegetable oil consumption. So diabetes during this period up 345 fold between 1954 and 2007. This is breast cancer in Japan. You can see on the lower left, breast cancer was 21.7 per 100,000 uh, uh, women in uh, 1977, I believe it was, climbs all the way to 101.4 per 100,000 in 1999. Um, again, while the calories, carbs, and sugar all go down, but again, in parallel to the, to the seed oils. So breast cancer is up five-fold between 1975 and 1999, again, in lockstep to the vegetable oils. And this is age-related macular degeneration, the leading cause of irreversible vision loss and blindness in people over the age of 65 worldwide. You can see that their macular degeneration was 0.2% in the 19, late 1970s. Climbed all the way to 16.37% by 2013. Um, again, while calories, carbs, and sugar go down, but again, in lockstep to the vegetable oil. So macular degeneration during this period, 
a period of about 35 years, went up 82-fold. And here's the dietary omega-6 in the red. And what I want you to notice is it parallels the vegetable oils, of course, because that's where they're coming from. So their omega-6, back when they were fantastically healthy in 1960, was, was 1%. Where were they in 2009? 7.8%. So let's look at the world really quickly. And this is uh, the entire globe's laboratory, really. So this is what I want to show you, is that seed oils, vegetable oils, have gone up infinitely. This is our um, awaiting to be published data. So on the far lower left, you'll see um, that vegetable oils were approximately zero grams per day. Certainly the seed oils were right at about zero grams a day in 1865 for the globe. You can see it climbs to the, all that in the blue, over, clear to 1960 is estimated and then based on all the literature. And then in 1961, we have, in, we have the known data from the FAO. So 1961, we're at 15 and a half grams per person per day, climbs all the way to 65 grams per person per day by 2014, right? So there's a near infinite increase in vegetable oils during this period. This is the estimated increase, just a hypothetical increase in chronic disease, which we think is also approximately infinite. Let's look at what's happened more recently. So this is obesity in men between 1975, when it was 3.2% in the red line there, climbs all the way to 10.8%, uh, by 2014, right, as the vegetable oils climb precisely along with that. But look at the sugar, it's virtually flat. This is obesity in women, exact same data for sugar and vegetable oils. You see the sugar is virtually flat, vegetable oils climbing, obesity in women climbs from 6.4% to 14.9%, so it also doubles again with uh, little change in sugar whatsoever. But let's look at carbohydrates, and this is BMI. You do this with you know, whichever data you want to look at, but this is BMI, and you can see in 1975 for men, it was 21.7 worldwide, climbed all the way to 24.2 by, by 2014, um, with a very close parallel to the vegetable oil increase. But look at the carbohydrate, it went down 1.4%, so a slight decline, or you might just call the carbohydrate flat. So average weight gain for men worldwide, 18 pounds in this period between 1975 and 2014. This is for women. You can see the BMI for women back in 1975, 22.1, climbs all the way to 24.4 by, by 2014. Again, as the carbohydrates slightly decline. But look at that parallel at lockstep uh, increase with vegetable oil. Average weight gain for women, 14 pounds during this period. This is diabetes for men globally, 4.3% back in 1980, all the way to 9%, it doubles by 2014 while the sugar is flat. You could see the vegetable oil parallel the diabetes in the blue there. And then this is diabetes in women, 4% back in 1980, all the way to 7.9%, it also doubles in parallel to the vegetable oil increase as the sugar is flat. So sugar's actually during this period down 1.7%, vegetable oils up 1.55 fold, and diabetes in women is up about two fold. Now this is what happened between 1961 and 2014 approximately for these numbers. Carbs were down 1.4%, sugar's up 20.2%, and edible oils up 322% or 4.22 fold, and global obesity and chronic disease just sort of through the roof, right? This is a video from uh, New York City, one of the earliest videos made uh, in uh, New York City, 1911. And what, the reason I want you to see this is because you can watch this for a long time and you will rarely see an overweight or obese person. They were about 1%, just like Scott Allen Carson's data showed. The point is, is that these people knew absolutely nothing about nutrition. They simply ate what was in the food supply. What was that food supply? It was meat heavy. They, ha they were very low in, in fresh fruits and vegetables because refrigeration in the homes was not available for about another 20 years, typically. Um, they ate lots of potatoes. They ate lots of grain. 35% of the diet was grain. Um, uh, of course, everything was organic back in that uh, era. 
And think of this, they had never witnessed a heart attack, first heart attack, 1912 in the US. There was five cases of Alzheimer's disease in the world at this time. Macular degeneration, rarely known, metabolic syndrome, never been diagnosed, type two diabetes was an extraordinary rarity, right? But what did they not have in the food supply at that time? They only had one gram of vegetable oils for the previous 45 years on average. Now, where are we 104 years later? We look a lot more like this in the United States, about 40% of our population, adult population is looking like this. Um, why? 86% of our fats are now vegetable oils. You know what that means? These people are innocent victims because they're simply eating what's in the food supply, just like the people in 1911. That, that's all because they're being fed metabolic, chronic metabolic biological poisons. Vegetable oils are killing us. They're hidden everywhere you look. Mark Twain said this, it's easier to fool people than to convince them they've been fooled. We've been fooled for 60 years into believing these vegetable oils are healthy. They are anything but. Just like a tornado ripping through this city, as I said to you in the beginning, wherever those vegetable oils go, they leave behind a massive trail of destruction. Ladies and gentlemen, I represent Cure AMD Foundation uh, and Ancestral Health Foundation, nonprofit organizations in the United States. I wanna thank Sam Feltham, all the organizers of the Public Health Collaboration UK, and I wanna thank all of you. It has been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much.